Next up, we got passengers sucked out of the airplane, bro. We got Mr. Bale. Mr. Bale. Yeah, okay. Hey, that Mr. Bale, you feel me? We in the dorm. Um, no more green screen. Not enough room. Not enough room. Whatever, though. You feel me? We still got Mr. Bale. Uh, before we start the video, we 40 subs from 1K. Hit the subscribe button. You know what I'm saying? But hey, let's see what it is. Hi. Today's story was all over the news a couple of years ago, but there was a mind blowing detail about the story that very few news outlets chose to report. And so today's story will end with that detail. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do. Can we have. April 17, 2018, 42-year-old Holly Mackey sat down in aisle seat 14C. See, bro, hold on. Before I start the video, bro, oh, my God. Because, look, I just got on a plane. I literally just got on a plane for my first time when I went to Jamaica. First time. And I flew out the country. So, it's even worse. You know what I'm saying? So, talk about scared. Like, bro, and this is what I'm scared of. You know what I'm saying? Flying out the window, like just being abandoned somewhere and fucking, you know what I'm saying? So, this is very bad, bro. Like, I'm so sorry for this person. Southwest Airlines plane. That morning, she, along with 143 other passengers and the five crew members, would be flying from New York City to Dallas, Texas. And then after that four hour flight, Holly would get off that plane and board another plane from Dallas to Oklahoma City, where she lived. But luckily, that flight was only about an hour. After Holly buckled her lap belt, she put her carry-on bag under the seat in front of her, and then she waited to see who was going to be sitting in the two seats to the left. A few seconds later, a 43-year-old bank executive and mother of two named Jennifer Reardon came walking down the aisle and stopped right outside of row 14 and turned into the aisle towards Holly. And Holly, who was kind of keeping her head down, she noticed there was this person standing outside of her aisle, and so she turned and looked up, and looking down at her was this big, bright smile, and Jennifer said to her, hey, you know, can I sit next to you? Is anybody using those seats? And Holly would say, nope, I'm here by myself, but right ahead. Unlike other airlines that would assign seats to all of their passengers before they boarded, Southwest Airlines has an open seating plan. What they do is they basically group passengers into boarding groups, but then once that group is on the plane, it's first come, first serve. After Jennifer slid past Holly and made her way to the window seat where she sat down, which was seat 14A, she buckled her lap belt, and then just like Holly, she took her carry-on bag and stuffed it under the seat in front of her, and then she pulled a paperback book out of her bag and started reading it. For the next few minutes, as more and more passengers came onto the plane, nobody took the seat between Holly and Jennifer, because generally speaking, people don't like riding in the middle seat if there is a window. Duh! Oh, you got the best picture ever! <laughs> sitting between two people for hours at a time. But eventually, the only seats left were middle seats. And at some point, this preteen girl who had her head buried in her phone, she comes onto the plane and she works her way down and she stops outside of row 14 and she very politely asks Holly if she can sit between her and Jennifer. And Holly says, absolutely. And so this girl slips past Holly and she sits down in seat 14B. She puts her lap belt on, she takes her carry-on, puts it under the seat in front of her, and then she just goes back to looking at her phone. Now that all of Holly's seatmates had arrived and she would not need to be getting out of the way for more people to come into a row, Holly kind of relaxed for a minute and she pulled out her iPad and she began scanning through the news as she waited for the plane to finish boarding. After all the passengers had been seated, one of the flight attendants closed the airplane door and then they grabbed the microphone and welcomed everyone aboard the plane and thanked them for choosing Southwest Airlines. And then they reminded everyone on board to make sure their seatbelt was fastened, that their tray was in the upright position, that their seat was upright as well, that they'd stowed big electronics. And then with the help of several other flight attendants, they went over some basic safety procedures in case of a mid-air emergency. Most of the passengers on this flight were really not paying attention to the safety brief. I was doing the same shit, I ain't gonna lie, I lie, bro. Because actually what happens is they do that same shit when you watch a movie too. I don't know about all the, uh, all the airlines, but on, on Delta, that's what the one I took. On Delta, uh, whenever you start a movie, it tell you about it still do it. Like, it tell you, uh, I ain't watched it though, so I don't know. But it, it tell you some shit about the airplane or something like that. But, 
Like it's it's kind of saying like uh what's it called uh what's that shit called uh the terms and conditions it's kind of like that like you're not about to read that you know what I'm saying because like what would you actually need that for and it's kind of fucked up how we don't care about the, our safety that much but because I mean you just you just pray like this is not gonna happen like all the times it happened to me you know what I'm saying that's how you think so it's like sending one last text message but Holly on the other hand she was paying careful attention. Now, this wasn't totally unusual for her. She was generally safety conscious. But for some reason on this flight, she just had a sense that something bad was about to happen. There was this deep sense of foreboding that she normally didn't feel on flights. And so she found herself really carefully paying attention to these procedures in case something did go wrong. After the brief was over, the attendant who was holding the microphone thanked everyone for listening and then said, sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. But Holly couldn't do that because one, she really did have this weird sense that something was off about this flight, that something bad was going to happen, and she just didn't know why. And then number two, she remembered that she had drank this huge cup of ice cream oh. before she boarded the plane, <laughs> and so now she really had to use the bathroom. But the plane had already begun taxiing over to the runway, and an attendant had told her she had to sit down. You can't go to the bathroom now. You gotta wait until we're up in the air. D. So who is now feeling very mentally and physically uncomfortable, found herself kind of anxiously looking to her left out the window as the plane continued to taxi to the top of the runway. And then once the plane was set, it paused for a second, and then the engines fired, and Holly and the girl next to her and Jennifer all got sucked back into their seat as the plane began hurtling down the track. And so Holly, the girl, and Jennifer, they're all turned, they're looking out the window as the plane is just bombing straight ahead, they're watching the airport kind of disappear out of view, and then they feel the plane begin to get lift, and then they take off. As the plane rapidly ascended, Holly turned away from the window and just sat back and closed her eyes and was just picturing that moment when they reached their cruising altitude and she would hear that chime in the cabin and then the captain would come on the intercom and say, we've reached our cruising altitude, it's now safe to get up and walk around, at which point Holly was going to run to the bathroom. And so when the plane finally got to a point where Holly felt like they were starting to level out, they probably were going to be at their cruising altitude soon, Holly preemptively undid her seatbelt and turn to face the aisle, getting ready for that chime in the cabin so she could get to the bathroom as soon as possible. But that chime That's low-key an L on her part, though, because why the fuck would you, you know what I'm saying? Why would you drink a whole, like, why would you drink all that before you go on this plane, bro? You got to think. You got to use your head. You got to think it to the future. Instead, when they reached their you know you're about to get on the plane. The captain came on the intercom, and she would tell everyone that they had reached their cruising altitude, but no one can leave their seats yet. They were expecting some fairly rough air, some turbulence. Dang. And so Holly was totally frustrated and disappointed, and she let out this audible grunt out of frustration. And Jennifer, who had her head in her book, she hears this grunt, and she turns to look at Holly to make sure she's okay. And at the exact same time, Holly found herself kind of looking down and turning towards the window to look out the window. And she made eye contact with Jennifer. And immediately Holly recognized that Jennifer thought something was wrong with her and she was kind of looking at her to make sure she was okay. And Holly just goes, I really have to go to the bathroom. And so at this, the two women kind of laughed about Holly's plight because it was kind of funny that she desperately needed to go but wasn't allowed to. And so eventually Jennifer just said, you know, I'm sure they'll let you go soon. And then Jennifer went back to a book and Holly went back to anxiously waiting to use the bathroom. And the girl sitting between them did not care at all. She was not listening to them. She didn't care. She had her head buried in the fall. After several minutes, Holly started to worry that it might be a while before she was allowed to get up and move around because she's looking at the flight attendants and they're all buckled into their jump seats and they were hitting some turbulence. And so Holly's thinking, okay, I gotta do something to take my mind off of this discomfort. Not only the physical discomfort of needing to use the bathroom, but also that strange foreboding just was not going away. And she didn't know what it was, but she just had the sense that something bad was going to happen. And so Holly decided she would do some work. So that's so bold, bro, because, like, especially if you got a plane and you feel like somebody, something bad about to happen, like, you really can't, you really can't stop it. You know what I'm saying? You can't stop it, really, because, like, you really think about it, okay, say you're around your friends or you feel like you about to go to a party, you can say, like, all right, I want to go. If you got a plane ticket that you just bought, you spent $600 on a ticket, $500 on a ticket, you know what I'm saying? You're not about to just say, I feel like something bad about to happen, I'm about to just not leave, you know what I'm saying? Which... Like, you feel me? Like, you're not about to just waste your money because you feel like something bad will happen. So, it's kind of like you can't, you can't help it. You know what I'm saying? You can't change the fact. At 11.04 a.m. Eastern, she reached.
reached down below the seat in front of her and began fishing around in her bag for her laptop. Before she could grab it, she heard two deafeningly loud sounds in rapid succession. The first was a popping sound that came from outside of the plane near the left wing, and the left wing was right outside of their window. And then she heard this whooshing sound that went through the entire cabin. It was like a high-powered vacuum. And then the entire cabin became freezing cold as the plane banked hard. To oh! In this fraction of a second, Holly sat up, and it was like she was immediately in shock. She's looking out across the other seats, and she sees all those oxygen masks have deployed from the ceiling. People are screaming. The attendants are running up and down the aisle trying to help people put their masks on as the plane is hard banking to the left. And Holly just kind of robotically reaches out and grabs the mask right in front of her. And she tries to put it on. But despite having listened intently to the safety brief, it was like her hands didn't work. And she couldn't get the band to extend long enough to put it over her head. And so she's fumbling with this mask, still in shock. She can't believe this is actually happening. This is how she's going to die. And then it's like she snaps out of it. And she forgets about the mask. And she turns left to make sure the girl and Jennifer were okay. And what she saw was absolutely horrifying. So the that popping sound she heard outside of the plane was the sound of the engine underneath the left wing exploding. Oh my the fucking god. The cowling, which is the outside of the engine. And the Nigga, what? broke apart, and one of the pieces of this cowling flew and hit the side of the aircraft that struck the window of row 14, Holly's row. And when it did that, it shattered the window completely, causing an explosive decompression of the cabin. When even a small hole opens up in a plane flying miles above the Earth, that hole will create hurricane-like forces inside of the cabin. D anything that is not completely anchored down, including people, will get sucked out of that hole. And in this case, that's what happened. When that window no. opened, Jennifer, who was sitting closest to it, was immediately sucked through the window. Now, she was not completely ejected because her seatbelt kept her from going completely out the window, but her entire upper half was now wedged outside of the plane. Oh As for God. the girl sitting next to Jennifer, in between Jennifer and Holly, she was still getting pulled towards the window because Jennifer, even though she had been pulled out, there were still segments of the window that were open. And so there was still suction towards the window. And so Holly instinctively reached over and grabbed this girl and pulled her in tight to her chest. And then with her left arm, she reached behind the girl and grabbed the belt of Jennifer. And she tried to pull Jennifer back into the plane, but she could tell there was no way she could pull her back. The forces pulling Jennifer out of the plane. So you gotta think about how high you're in the air, bro. That, that wind up there, like you're above the clouds. You're above the cloud. Like that's, oh my God, bro. Oh my god, I don't want to get back on a plane tomorrow. No, I'm not getting on a plane. Fuck that. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. This is happening. There's going to be a sensor or something. The flight crew has got to be aware that a person is getting pulled out of the plane. But in reality, the captain and the flight crew, they were aware that the left engine had blown up. That was the thing they were actively trying to combat to try to keep the plane from crashing. But they had no idea about the drama that was unfolding in Rome. What about all? The, what about all, everybody else? From, like, every other passenger, like, did they see this happening? Did, was they like screaming? You know what I'm saying? Like, did not nobody hear this happening? Like, only one person got screaming, "Oh my god!" And then everybody look over there. You know what I'm saying? Like, that didn't happen. They did like. And so Holly is holding on to Jennifer. She's holding on to this girl, and she's. And Holly's a W for that too. W, Holly's literally fucking superwoman. Holly trying to save people' life and shit. Yo, Holly and W. Not for anybody in the plane to please take notice of the fact right. that Jennifer is stuck out of the plane, right. but the sound that was being created by this open window was deafening. Nobody could hear anybody else in this plane. Why? Wow, because it was so loud. The plane is banging hard to the left. Oh my God. Everybody on board believes they are about to die. So no one is looking around, taking stock of what's going on and assessing what to do next. Everybody's in survival mode and is basically just focused on themselves. 
And so despite Holly yelling out and trying to wave to people, it was worthless. Jennifer was just stuck out the window and no help was coming. And so for several minutes, Holly is just holding on to Jennifer. She's holding on to this girl. She's screaming out for help, but no one's hearing her. And then eventually, as the plane began to come back from its bank, and it seemed like the pilot was taking control of the craft, even though it was deafening inside and it was still terrifying, people began to open up their blinders a little bit and they started to look around and some people sitting in the vicinity of row 14, they noticed what was going on with Jennifer and they began yelling and waiting for the flight attendants. But again, the sound from this window was deafening. There was just no way the attendants could hear them. And even though everyone's waving at the attendants, the attendants are very preoccupied. They're dealing with the people right in front of them who are all very worried and concerned. They're trying to talk to the captain about what they need to do next. And so they did not see there was this emergency happening. And so for several more minutes, Jennifer is just stuck out the window with nobody helping her. And it was during this time as Holly is holding on to her waist and she's holding on to the girl that Holly is thinking, you know, Jennifer, she's been stuck outside the plane where there's no oxygen for almost 10 minutes. Nobody can survive that. Is there a hate? And Jennifer has been forced through this window that's not big enough to have a person fit through it. And so Holly found herself moving her left hand that was gripping on to Jennifer's waist. She just let go of it, not because she she's was dead. To Jennifer. Frankly, her hand was not keeping Jennifer from going anywhere. It was just kind of habitual that she was holding on to her waist. So she takes her hand off of her waist. And, and she, she was just like. It right in the center of Jennifer's back. Like she was comforting Jennifer. She was showing Jennifer that you're not alone. We can't help you, but you're not alone. And the woman in row 15. Wait, what? Hold on, what? I missed something. Frankly, her hand was not keeping Jennifer from going anywhere. It was just kind of habitual that she was holding on to her waist. So she takes her hand off of her waist and she just places it right in the center of Jennifer's back. Like she was comforting Jennifer. She was showing Jennifer that you're not alone. We can't help you, but you're not alone. And the woman in row 15, an older woman, she saw Holly do this. And she reached across and she put her hand on Holly's back. It was like everybody knew this is a total crisis, but there's just nothing we can do, even if it's killing Jennifer. Despite the damage to the left engine from it exploding, the captain, Tammy Jo Schultz, who was a longtime veteran of the airline, she was able to combat this hard bank to the left, and she regained control of the plane, at which point, through the intercom, she was able to bark out orders that were loud enough for the flight attendants to actually hear. Bro, and that's another thing. The fucking, when we was on Delta, the shit was so quiet, bro. You, no one could hear that shit. Literally, the shit was so fucking quiet, bro. The, the, the whatever they use at intercom, bro, that shit was so quiet. I'm like, I don't know if it's because it's just a thing, you know what I'm saying? It's talking, it's really not that serious to hear it or not. But, like, even the safety, you really couldn't hear the safety. You really couldn't even hear it for real. Like, the say, when they talk about the safety shit, they did, you couldn't even hear it. The shit was so, because there's so much, uh, like, fans and shit going on. And, like, people walk around talking. It's, like, it's so low. You know what I'm saying? You can't hear it. But I don't know if, if it's that that plane or what. I don't know what it was. Delta. To get up, I don't know. Walk down the aisles and make sure the passengers are okay. And this is when the crew spotted Jennifer. They acted quickly and rushed over and they grabbed Holly and they go next to her and they safely got them out of that row and moved them to a different row. And then once they were gone, how? Two men named Andrew and Tim. How did they give them? How did the what? They moved to a different row. Was the passage? Was it? Was the whole plane not uh full? Volunteered to go in row fourteen. And pull Jennifer back into the plane. They knew the risks. They pulled her in. There is still an opening in this plane, and they could very easily just get sucked out themselves. But they didn't care. They knew they needed to help this woman. W. So the two men walked into row 14. They got in position, and with all their might, they were able to pull Jennifer in. They got her into the aisle, and then the two men were able to leave row 14 without being sucked out. And so Jennifer is laying in the aisle, and a passenger who happened to be a nurse, who was named Peggy, she rushed over and she began performing CPR. At this point, Holly remembers looking around the cabin and seeing that everybody was just perfectly still. It was still deafeningly loud inside of the cabin because this window is still sucking air out. So it's very, very loud. But she's looking out, and there was just this aura of calm inside the plane. No one was running around, no one was panicking, everyone was just kind of sitting, watching as Peggy was trying to save Jennifer's life. At 11.21 a.m., so 17 minutes after that pop was... She died? Plane, 
the captain of this plane oh. is able to successfully perform an emergency landing. Ooh. As soon as they touched down on the runway, the captain had already coordinated with a medical team who was standing by. Wow. Grabbed Jennifer, they rushed her out, they got her to the hospital, but unfortunately she didn't make it. She died from blunt force trauma from having been forced out of that. Oh room. my she god, no! It happened too suddenly and they killed her. Holly was Fuck. obviously very shaken up by this experience, just like the rest of the passengers who were on board. But there's a detail in Holly's story that makes her experience even more dramatic. On the morning she got on this plane, she arrived at the airport fairly early, she had a big coffee with her, and she got in line for security. So as she's going through this line, she's drinking this huge coffee, and then when it's her turn to actually go through the scanners, she finishes this coffee, she throws it away, she goes through security, and by the time she's on the other side, she's now late. And so she runs all the way to her gate, and when she boards, her boarding group has already gotten on. And so all the seats that she liked to take, those were already gone. She liked to sit towards the front of the plane. Wow. Because she liked the people that got off the plane first. Once wow. The and so she began looking for the first open row that she was wow. in. So she starts walking down the row, and she finally gets to row 14. She's looking on her left, and there's a totally open row. Three open seats. And so, like she always did on long flights. Bro, imagine, bro. Imagine the seat. Like, just imagine walking down the aisle, and the aisle you pick could be the aisle that... You could die in. On all the other aisle, row 14. Row 14. Window seat, seat 14A, because she could lean her head up against the side of the plane and sleep. And so after she buckled herself in and put her luggage underneath the seat in front of Wait, whoa, what did you just say? She took the window seat, seat 14A, because she could lean her head up against the side of the plane. Oh, this is Jolly story? Sleep. And so after she buckled herself in and put her luggage underneath the seat in front of her, she remembered she had just drank that huge cup of coffee. Oh! And even though she didn't oh. know right then, she expected to probably have to go a couple of times once they took off. And so not wanting to disrupt... Oh, I bet she didn't, she didn't go to the bathroom. Yeah, that's funny about it. She didn't go to the bathroom. It's, all, it's really all in your mind. You can, you can like kind of want to go to bed. Go to, I said bed. You kind of want to go pee, but it's really all your mind, though. You know what I'm saying? It's all your mind. People that were inevitably going to take the two seats next to her, like constantly all flight long, getting up and sneaking past them to go to the bathroom. Do look over at this. Again. The decides, you know what? I'll just move. I will sit in the aisle seat. It's not as good because I can't sleep, but at least this way I can get up and use the bathroom without disrupting the people I'm sitting with. And so she unbuckles herself. She reaches down. She grabs her bag from underneath the chair in front of her. She stands up and she moves two seats over to the aisle seat of row 14. She sits down. She puts her seatbelt on. Wow. She puts her luggage under the seat in front of her there. And then as she's kind of getting herself situated, she sees someone has stopped right outside of row 14. And so she turns and looking down at her is the smiling face of Jennifer Bearden. And she says, hi, you know, is anybody sitting next to you? Can I sit next to you? And Holly says, absolutely. And Jennifer sneaks past her and sits in the room. So that's going to do it, guys. If you've got oh my God, bro. That's crazy as if. That's tough. I ain't going to lie. Hey man, y'all like, comment, subscribe. Comment, share me yet to next, man. Follow me on Instagram, that's where I'm most active at. We're on the grind of 1K, man. I'm out.